In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much, O Lord, for being wisdom. Thank you, Lord, because in you we find rest and guidance and direction and peace and trust and confidence and assurance um, in this <laughs> crazy, mad world. Um Lord, please be with all those who are suffering, struggling, fearful, anxious, exhausted, weary, and uh, let them know somehow, Lord, that you are the source of all that they need and everything they need. Um, be with us, Lord, in this Bible study tonight. Um, Lord, we do pray for the upcoming elections, federal, state, or local that your will be done, Lord, uh, above all. And uh, even if we make mistakes, oh Lord, that you bless and you cover and you um, grant us your grace even when we mess up. And we thank you for that, Lord. We ask that please hear us through the intercessions that may and all you saints of martyrs, so please you from the beginning through the martyr part of your life-giving cross. Please, oh Lord, make us worthy to be thankfully, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us they our daily bread. Give us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thou is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, George, first guy we have, other than me. <laughs> hmm. All righty, so um, last time we were uh, we finished chapter six uh, from 12 to the end of it, and I'll mention some of the highlights we covered real quick to kind of refresh our memory, and as usual, just jump in if you have any comments or anything. Um, we discovered something lovely, encouraging, hopeful, motivating, everything nice. We discovered that wisdom wants to be known, wants to be found. And we started to see how like wisdom is a person. Like she hastens to make herself known to those who truly desire her. And um, we uh, talked about how, I think it was Missy who said that comment, like how seeking the Lord diligently and early means diligently and early in the morning, diligently and early in life, and diligently and early like in every situation or in any crisis. Uh, to 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 be in the habit of going to God first and foremost. Um, and that's not something that's going to happen by being intentional. That's going to ha something that's going to happen only by having that intimate relationship with God. Then we, without thinking about it, we're just going to go to him first or most of the time. And then we talked about anxiety a little bit. We said that the best way, according to uh, verse 15, in chapter six and said, got to be some, something and anxiety will quickly leave you. And we said that the best way to repel anxiety is to keep your eyes and your thoughts fixed on God. Truly, like it says in Psalm 46, 10, that we have on the iconostasis above the royal gate, be still and know that I'm God. Be still, be at peace, be anxiety free and know that I'm God. Remember, keep your eyes on and your thoughts on me, um, that I'm God. And then we started to look into what makes a person worthy of wisdom and to be indwelled by wisdom and to be led and guided by her. Um, we did bring up another question. I'll mention the three the three points at the end of, of what makes a person worthy of wisdom. So far that we got, there's probably going to be more that will come across um, we asked another question, which was, I don't know, kind of convicting to me, at, at least a little bit, which is, do you love discipline and do you desire to be disciplined as in trained or even if it came in the form of a rebuke or do you get annoyed by it and shy away from it? Yeah, yeah. if we are wise, <laughs> upon intended, we will at least not mind it and welcome it. Um, hmm. 
Excuse me. We said those that seek wisdom and instruction, but then don't keep it or don't live by it, are like someone who sought after the most precious diamond in the whole world and then did what with it? Do you remember? Threw it in the trash. Uh, so seeking alone is is lovely, but alone it's it's good for nothing. Um, and then we talked about how like the 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 three steps steps to be indwelt by wisdom. Let me. Do you all remember what they are? Not three steps. Three things we need to do, or three things we need to be. To be indwelt by wisdom, to be led by wisdom, and guided by wisdom. <clears throat> we look. We look for her. We seek it. Okay. We seek the wisdom. Yes. And uh, then, anyone else? Implement it. Yes. Live by it. Not just seek it, apply it or apply her. And then the third one, that was the point that uh, Michael really liked. Just reminding. Don't apply it. Seek. Do not swerve. from truth or take envy as a partner or as a travel companion. So the, the, the three things to be indwelt by wisdom and led by wisdom and guided by wisdom. Uh, first one was in verse 17 in chapter six, we're talking here was the most sure beginning wisdom is the most sincere desire for instruction and concern for discipline and instruction is loving her. Someone who really wants to be taught um, to learn. And not just for the sake of knowledge, but for the sake of living by it, which is the second point in verse 18, which is the why behind desiring wisdom. Is that someone who wants to be taught in order to keep this wisdom and to live by this wisdom. Said loving her means keeping her laws and obeying her laws guarantees incorruptibility and morality, immortality, sorry. <laughs> and just like God said, uh, if you love me, keep my commandments, live by them. That's what shows me, What that's what shows God that we really love him. It's not all the praise and worship and tears and like, you know, all that stuff. And I mean, that's lovely, but it means nothing if we don't live that way. That's what shows that we really love God. Is that we live this way and, and obey his wills, even when it's hard, especially when it's hard. And then the last step, <clears throat> to be worthy with wisdom, to be dwelt by her and led by her and guided by her, is to not swerve from the truth. Or you can say to remain straight and steady in the truth and to avoid envy as a travel companion. Like avoid envy like the plague that it is. And um, that's pretty much the, the the main points we got from chapters or from that half of chapter six and uh, brings us to today. So I think now we're ready to start with uh, chapter seven. But before we do, does anybody have any uh, questions or comments or anything they want to add or anything? I don't know that this is going to be helpful, but, you know, Abuna, there's a whole group of people, <clears throat> particularly men, who do seem to be desiring a wiser way, a better way, and who are willing to implement whatever it is that they're being told, but they're going to like sources that are actually harmful, not helpful. So, so there's, they're, they're sincerely seeking and searching, but perhaps they're, they're not aware to, to what sources are to be trusted. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And of course, because they're sincere, whatever source they come across, they are they are faithful to it. Because right. their the intentions are right. Uh, which is right. Uh, which is right, but but there's a couple of things. Um 
One is it tells us that we have a responsibility mm. to, you know, share with everybody and to try as much as possible, especially when we found somebody who is sincerely seeking. And the second thing is that, uh, yani, we're going to, what's the word? We're not going to freak out. We're going to do this, but we're not going to freak out because as God promised that, you know, those who seek will find. Like God wants to be found and he will hopefully um, direct them to himself. Hopefully when they seek those things, from the wrong sources and they found out that something isn't driving here. It's not measuring up. It doesn't add. I'm, I still don't feel it or whatever that they will keep seeking somewhere else before they quit and give up <clears throat> that in combination with God placing them in our lives or placing us in their lives will hopefully um, make it happen. It's a good point though. Thank you. So, uh, Alma, what did you want to say? Yes, uh, about do not serve from truth. How can I do this? How how can I stick to the truth? What can help me to do this? Because sometimes we are yani. Some people can tell us something, and he's not telling the truth, but. As a simple one or simple uh, girl may not, she's 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 yani deceived. What can help us to to be wise, yani? I'd I'd love to hear from everybody. My 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 two cents is is what helps me. Um, well, it doesn't always help me. Um. I'm not claiming that I always 100% of the time speak the truth. Um, is remembering that what Jesus said, that he said, I am the truth. <clears throat> so this helps keep me in check because it reminds me that whenever I decide, yani knowingly, to take the truth out or to sway away from the truth, to swear for the truth, then I'm kicking him out of the situation or the formula. And he's going to be it's like, okay, you want me out, I'm out. But then I'm kicking him out and his covering and his protection and his benefits and his blessings and his peace. And 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 I'm kicking out wisdom from my life or from this situation. So if I do that, then by all means, it's already messed up. It's not going to work out well. So even if it's hard or scary or intimidating or uncomfortable or whatever, uh, make the decision to tell the truth. Uh, sometimes it may mean I prefer not to talk about that or let's talk about something else or I I don't care to share or I change topics or you know what I'm saying? Like I don't have to answer. Um, uh, or if I'm going to speak truth to somebody that may be unpleasant to them to hear that I will try to, if my purpose is truth and that the truth is received by them, then I will try to present it in a most receivable way, you know, like the St. Paul sandwich, kindly, pleasantly, um, clearly, succinctly, maybe. <laughs> no, a half truth is a good lie. Uh, that was a, a question on the chat. Um, oh, y'all don't see that. It was just to me. Uh, uh, the question was, what about half truths? half-truth is a good lie. They say the best lies are half-truths or part-truths. And also there's no white lies or little lies or whatever. Um, it does make it hard sometimes. Yes, omitting truth is a lie. Um, <clears throat> so I I'll share this with you all. Nobody asked about this, but... Um, Something that 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 like an exercise that I talk about a lot with with you know people who confess about lying. They say like I don't know why I lie. I didn't even have a need to. It was like something really dumb. It wasn't like whatever. Like, but I I don't know what happened. I got flustered and I lied. And it's it's easy to to know what's the best way to go about something, you know, hindsight. <laughs> um, but there's a little exercise that really eliminates lying from our life. 
which is simply this is a very simple decision. It's that, okay, moving forward, if I ever lied to somebody, I will go back to this person, whether it's five minutes later, five hours later, five days later, whatever, as soon as I'm aware of it, I will go to go back to this person, tell them, by the way, I said so-and-so, and I should have said X, Y, Z. That's it. That's the, that's the solution. That's the decision. It starts with people correcting this, whether it be minutes later, hours later, days later. Um, nine times out of 10, the person who receives this, they go like, uh, okay, like they don't care. Like, okay, fine, thanks. If anything, they start respecting this person or liking them more because they're so keen to being honest. And then if I stick with this for a couple of weeks, then um, after a while, I'll find myself, you know, fixing it as soon as it comes out of my mouth. I said, oh, I lied. I said so-and-so. Yeah, that's sometimes people say the words, I lied. Um, and then if I stick with that after a couple of weeks or a week or something, then I fix it mid-sentence. While the words are coming out, I correct them. And then if I stick with that for another couple of weeks or a week or whatever, then I fix it mid-thought before the words come out. And um, and that's it. If I do that, then halas, the line is done. Oh, I see more, more uh, texting here, chatting. Hold on. But you can't really go in depth with someone, for example, who asks you if you celebrate Halloween. Why not? Why can't you go in depth? You just simplify your answer. Okay, you can simplify, but tell the truth. Um, we sent a uh, text to the whole congregation a couple of days ago with a link, uh, with a video. Uh, by Abu Matthias about uh, titled "Should uh, Christians Celebrate Halloween or Not?" and it's very detailed with a lot of research. So it's, it's really very convincing. So what you can tell them, well, you know, I learned cer certain things about Halloween that made me decide uh, that I, I didn't want to have any part to do with it. And hey, if you'd like, I can send you the link of that video. There you go. That's truth. We're not saying any speaking truth, as in give lectures or sermons or or sit there and talk to somebody for an hour. It could be any simple. And actually, I don't know, I feel like truth is simple. Abuna, where is this video of, about the Halloween? Uh, we sent it to the whole congregation on the, do you have the Remind app? Oh. Uh, the link is on there. Okay. It was Thank just you. sent a couple of days ago, I think. Okay, thanks. If anybody wants to, they can um, uh, put it on the chat here, and uh, and uh, anybody can just click on the link and see it. Good point. Truth. But we have to, even if it's hard or unpleasant or whatever, because me. truth will set us free. All right. Chapter seven. Where am I? Here. This will take too long. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, we'll start by reading from uh, verse one through six in chapter seven. Yeah, who's going to read? I will. I will, Apuna. Thank you. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, I mean. Which... Uh, Coptic which... reader. Okay. One through six. <clears throat> okay. Certainly I myself am also a mortal man, like everyone in the offspring of this earth, which was made beforehand. And in my mother's womb, I was fashioned with care. Within the time of 10 months, made of blood from the seed of man and the delight of sleeping together. And when I was born, I drew in the common air, and in similar fashion, I fell upon the earth, and the first voice I uttered, like everyone, was crying. I was nursed in swaddling clothes and with great care. For none of the kings had any other beginning of birth. Therefore, there is only one entrance for everyone into life, and the same in leaving. Glory be to the Holy Trinity, our God, forever unto the age of all age. Thank you. Okay. So, 
this is so clever, so wise. Um, lest anyone starts thinking, well, okay, this is all lovely, you know, all the stuff we read, but like, I'm no King Solomon or like this wise sage Solomon, the author of this book. Um, where, uh, where am I? And where's the this true wisdom? No way I could ever be like that. So, in his wisdom, no pun intended, this Solomon anticipates this thought and responds to it in verse one here. And he says, Like all the others, I too am a mortal man, descendant of the first being, Adam, fashioned from the earth. I was molded in flesh within my mother's womb. He's saying there's nothing super special about me. So, you know, just like uh, James 1 tells us in verse 5 and 6, I think one of you mentioned this last time, it says, James 1 verses 5 and 6, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith and with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. What is this no doubting thing? Basically that if I come across stuff that seems to be opposite from the Bible, first clarify, make sure you understand. But if you do and you confirm that it's opposite from the Bible, don't be wavering. <clears throat> Without a doubt, I'm going to stick to what the Bible says, to what the church teaches us, to what our capital T traditions teaches, the teachings of the apostles. Um, so like the, the steps we learned from the last chapter so far about being worthy of wisdom or to be met by wisdom or indwelt by her and led and guided by her, we said there was sincere desire of instruction and to be disciplined, obeying and keeping and living by those instructions and not swerving from the truth or taking envy as a traveling partner or a traveling companion. <clears throat> and he says, as born like everybody else, I will die like everybody else. Nothing supernatural or extra special here. So question. Do you truly believe that you too can be a holy, righteous, wise saint? And I want an answer on this one. It's not rhetorical. It's possible, but it takes a lot of work. Okay. But it's possible. I'm banking on it. Good for you. You must believe it, y'all. You must believe it. Otherwise, why bother, right? I'd be spinning my wheels. Why why go through all this? And of course, while keeping in mind that it is only by God's grace and through his mercy that he is the one who can make me this way, if I don't let it go to my head. You know, if I don't let it get to my head and, and you know, and be arrogant and stuff. And if I always remember where or whom it came from. I can guarantee you this. God will not make us, uh, you know, um, all righteous and, and, and sinless and wise and all that stuff. I didn't mean literal sinless, but um, if it's, it's dangerous to us. If making us this way, we'll we'll get to our head, and then we'll we're going to think more highly of ourselves and forget him. Abuna is the uh, discernment connected to wisdom, or is it wisdom? The it's same? related to wisdom, but it's different. Discernment is being able to discern, or to <laughs> that's not helpful. Being able to differentiate between yeah. what is godly and what is not godly, between what is yeah. right and what is wrong, between um, <clears throat> what is truth and what is falsehood or a lie, etc. To be able to tell the difference between something. You know, like something could be coming, like I could see it from a long, a long ways ago, and discernment tells us, you know, tells, let's say, our, our metropolitans, 
<clears throat> or our bishops, they can see something happening on the horizon. And so they, because that's their duty, they warn the congregations. They warn the diocese, the church, and saying, this is not good. Don't do that. Stay away from that. Don't participate in that. Don't partake in it. Now, some of us don't have half the discernment that they do. But I don't have to. I just need to have obedience and trust and all that without a doubt, right? Without doubting. So even if I don't see it, I just need to trust that they have the discernment. And even if they don't, I get the blessing of obedience. And even if they're wrong, God will make it work out for the best. So I obey. But now, nowadays, I'm sad to say that even within churches, I see this. It's a societal thing. It's like there's this spirit of rebellion, the spirit of arrogance. Like, no, first, I this has to make sense to me, and I have to be convinced of it to me. And but if it's not, no, I'm dumping it. I'm I'm not gonna uh, abide by it. Even when it comes to the Bible, I've I've had I've heard Christians. Say this like this verse doesn't make sense. This passage doesn't make sense. I don't like this chapter. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna pass it. Ada. <laughs> so who's the God here? Is it thy will be done or my will be done? Um excuse me, Abona. Can I just say something about that? I I understand yeah. the the times when people say that and it's not fitting, but at other times. Do you think that it would be okay to say, you know what, I like, I don't understand this. So I'm going to table this for a while and I'm going to focus on these other things in my relationship with God. And then maybe God will like open up an understanding of whatever it is that I'm not understanding later on. Yeah, that's totally fine. That's, okay. That's a good attitude. That's just saying, you know what? There are many things that I did not understand in the Bible before and did not make any sense to me. But as I grew older, they did make sense to me. So therefore, this one might be one like those. It doesn't make any sense to me right now. So I will wait. And when God finds me ready or whatever, I will understand it. But by the way, don't just table it right away. Like, do ask. You can table it after exhausting some resources, you know, asking your father confession or uh, servants in the church or wise people, you know, godly people or the bishop or metropolitan or whatever. And if you still didn't get an answer you liked, then you can go to that. But I'm not saying it's it's wrong to to say I don't understand this. Of course, it's fine to not understand stuff. But what I'm saying is don't dismiss it or reject it because it doesn't make sense to you or because you don't understand it, but rather seek and ask and try to learn. And then you will understand. And if you didn't get an answer that was satisfactory, Keep on searching and asking. In the meantime, don't reject it. Just say, okay, one day this will make to me. Right now, this is above my understanding. Also, Jesus said, Yabuna, you will know later. Yes. He did tell um, uh, the disciples, the apostles, like, right now you don't understand, but you will understand later on. Um, Abuna. I Does wanted to go back like revelation. to Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. To go back to Mama's original question about discernment, could you think of discernment as right judgment that is the fruit of wisdom? Yeah. I'd be okay with that. So like we were saying earlier, was you know, discernment is to look no to differentiate between right or from wrong, light from dark, you know, good from bad. Wisdom is um like what would be a good way to handle the situation? Or how do I speak here? What do I answer there? Or what do I, how do I handle this problem? Or, or what would God want me to do here? Stuff like that. Um, actually, when you look carefully at the prayer of King Solomon, uh, what he asked God, he did. He asked for both. He said, <clears throat> "I want to have wise wisdom and a discerning heart." Said, I don't know my right from my left. Like I'm, I'm a kid. I'm a child. Like I don't know anything. How am I gonna lead these people if you don't? And his whole desire was to do God's will with these people as a king for them. Um, and we're gonna hopefully, if we have time, we'll get to that. 
uh, near the end of uh, chapter 7. Because it says something uh, like, I, I don't want to burn it, but it's like, it says something about without guile, without um, falsehood. So we need to believe, we must believe that by God's grace, and, and if I submit to him, if I trust him, I can become a holy and righteous saint. I can become a wise person. And like as King Solomon is telling us, or Solomon the sage, the author of this book is saying like, hey, I'm like everybody else. I was born like everybody else. I'm going to die like everybody else. Then in verse 2, it says, for 10 months taking shape in her blood by means of virile seed and pleasure sleeps companion. Is that how you pronounce this word? Virile? Or virile? Any uh, originally English? Viral. Word? Viral. No, viral is like bacterial or viral. Is yeah. it uh, virile or vir viral? Any English nerds here? Where's Michael Takla? He's, he would know. I know, and I'm probably going to mess it up, but I've always heard it as virile. Virile. Okay. Um, anyway, fertile. <laughs> um, so he's saying, I was conceived by my father and my mother, just like everyone else. I'm not con there's no immaculate conceptions here. But wait a minute. What's up with this 10-month thing? Last I checked, I thought the normal human pregnancy is only nine months. Or is it that... We're getting so used to wanting things faster, 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 drive through society. So now we reduce it from 10 months to nine months. <laughs> Is this a typo? Is this an error? It says in English and in it's Arabic. You can read time. Arabic. How is, how is 10 months, 40 weeks? I don't know. <laughs> That, that would be true only if a week is, uh, what, four days? Uh, sorry, uh, if a month is... Uh, Maybe only the business Four days. weeks. <laughs> no, actually, that does work, Abuna, because uh, if it's 40 weeks, a month is a month is four weeks, typically. Four weeks, yeah. Oh, so that's no. 10 months. A month yeah. is 30 days or 31 days. Uh -huh. Four weeks is 28 days. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. It's... But the calendar that they were on, is that <clears throat> is that the same? Yes, there you go. Is, was it babies <laughs> were bigger back then? They needed longer to cook? No. This is one <laughs> of the verses. The reason I'm making a point out of this is because this is one of the verses that show us how science is until today discovering what the uh, Bible has always been saying. Yes, uh, yes. Um, he's talking about 10 lunar months. So like Miss was saying, the calendar was different. And a lunar month is 28 days. It's exactly four weeks. If you ask any OBGYN nowadays, or really anybody who knows how to read and write, um, if you ask them how long is the normal average pregnancy, they will tell you right away that it's what? 40 weeks, which is the self-same 10 lunar months. <clears throat> so uh, that's why it says here 10 months, right? Um, and as we have learned before, what is special in the Bible about the number 40? Y'all better answer because we said this like a million times. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Somebody uh, said... Y'all gonna need to get my attention when you send something on the chat because uh, I don't always notice it. It doesn't look deep or something. Question. How was Gideon's questioning of God different from how we question God? Um, he wasn't objecting. He just wanted assurance because he was terrified, and what 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 he was hearing um, was overwhelming. Like I'm I'm like the least of my clan, and my family's the smallest of all the families, and I'm the weakest of the weak. And you, 
Mr. Angel or this thing that I'm seeing are telling me that I'm going to do this, that I'm going to fight this war, that I'm going to free the Israelites and conquer the enemy. And um, and he didn't say, no, 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 no. I must be uh, hallucinating. I'm out of here. Peace. That's what I'm talking about that we shouldn't do. He asked and asked and asked, and he was convinced. It's kind of similar to, um, there's a statement that both Zechariah the priest and St. Mary said to Archangel Gabriel, but they got different responses, right? Both of them said, how can this be? Zechariah said, how can this be? Like, I'm old and my wife is old or her womb is uh, dry or something like that. And St. Mary said, how can this be since I don't know a man? But with St. Mary, the angel told her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, etc., overshadow you, um, and the power of Most High. And But with Zechariah told them, uh, yeah, because you asked this, uh, is nothing, anything impossible to God? Because you asked this, you're going to be mute until he's born. <clears throat> so there are questions that can sound exactly the same, but have a different um, thought or intentional meaning behind it. Please ask. Please question. Please. We love questions. We're not saying just take it as is and just shut up and do it. And But no, no, no. You need to understand so that you can have conviction and, and be confident and motivated to, to apply it in your life and to do it. We're just saying that after you've asked and questioned and all that stuff and exhausted the sources... And if there's still something that doesn't make sense to you, you can, like like Missy was saying, you can table and you say, okay, one day I will get this. And keep it in your prayers. Say, God, like you want to reveal to us yourself. You want to reveal to us the truth. So show me what you mean here. Just like Daniel did with the uh, with the dreams. <clears throat> so now, sorry, Missy, I uh, I interrupted you. I was asking what what is special about the number 40? What did we learn about the number 40 in the Bible? Uh that it's like a combination of the earthly and the divin and the divine, because it's four times ten. So it is four times ten, but what you state you said is not quite accurate. Oh, sorry. Yes, intention is key. Uh, four. Four is the uh, the the whole world, north, south, and east. Mm -hmm. The whole world, I mean. And 10 is the complete number. Yes. Complete number. Very good. Is that 40 is a symbol of a completion or a complete uh, uh, life on earth. So after 40 weeks, there it is again. Then the forming of the human being is perfected, it's completed. And then it's time for this baby to leave the womb and to be born. And as we saw before, like Moses fasted 40 days, Elijah fasted 40 days, Jesus fasted 40 days. The Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years, uh, representing, before they got to the promised land, representing us humans um, going from bondage to the land, to the promised land. We'll spend 40 years, meaning a full life in the wilderness. Uh, as St. Paul said, we must, through much tribulation, make it to the kingdom of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ ascended to heaven 40 days after the resurrection. So he stayed with them a complete amount of time after his resurrection, uh, not just his uh, his incarnation before the, the crucifixion. Um, and then he, he continues um, detailing how normal, like everybody else, his, he is in, in, in verse 3. He says, I too, when I was born, I drew in the common air. I fell on the same ground that bears us all and wail. Should be wailed, right? Um, at my first sound, as for all the rest. Um, something I came across when preparing for the Bible study I thought was really interesting. It's like an interesting dichotomy. At the time of a person's birth on this earth, and with his or her first breath 
he wails, cries, while everybody around him is rejoicing. And if he doesn't cry at all at his birth, then everybody around him would wail, would cry. Isn't that interesting? The sign of life on this earth that a person wails, that he cries. He must wail in order to get his lungs to start working. The first work of man as soon as they are born is to cry. Um... Verse 4, he says, I was nurtured in swaddling cloths with he, every... Hmm? Sorry. Is he crying because he knows what we'll see will happen in the world? Uh, no, he's crying because he's a baby just born. That's scientifically correct, yes. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, Verse 4 is saying, I was nurtured in swaddling cloths with every care. Saying I was 100% dependent. 100% need to be cared for. Did you know that? That like a lot of animals, um, fish, I don't know, snakes, bugs, spiders, you name it. Like when they're born, that's it. Like <laughs> they're like good to go. But we, like humans, we're 100% dependent. If we are left alone, sooner or later, within a very short period of time, we would die. So there's a lesson here, which is, and, and I want us all to remember this, that no matter how hard your life was or how hard your life has been, the simple fact that you are here with us right now today as an adult means that you have been cared for by somebody. Don't ever allow yourself to feel like a victim or have self-pity or to wallow in it. You know, a victim who was never cared for in any way. This is straight up from the devil and the gates of hell. He wants us to feel self-pity so that we can feel bad enough so that we can excuse ourselves to do bad choices and so that we can... Um, be angry at God or curse God and die. Right? Since we agreed that a human being, when they're born, 100% dependent. The fact that you made it so far in life to adulthood, that means somebody somewhere nurtured you in swaddling cloths with every care. Agreed? Abuna, it's so funny that you bring this up because today <clears throat> when I was at that service, mm -hmm. there was a lady who had come through the line and she had shared, you know, some parts of her life and everything. And she had said something about her dad, uh, about him not being a good man. And then she was like, you know what? I I shouldn't I shouldn't have said that. Um, he did bad things to me, but he took care of me when I was a baby. Wow. So it's interesting that, that you just said that. Wow. That's cool. Thank you for sharing that. I don't know if you ever thought about that, but the fact that I'm here right now, that means somebody or somebody's, like multiple people, really were attentive to take care of me. At the very least, my my like physical nurturing, you know, care, food, bathing, clothes, whatever needs. That says, even if you are a king or a queen, you have the same beginning, just like the rest of us, says verse 5 here. He says, um, no king has known any other beginning of existence. And not only the same beginning, just like everyone else, but also the same end, just like everyone else. That's in verse 6. Um, For all, there is one way into life, one way only into life as out of it. For all of us, there's one way only into life and one way only out of it. This reminds me of a, a nice bumper sticker that I saw a long time ago. I bet Macy would know what it is if I uh, 
Oh, that's funny. She just put it in the chat. <laughs> yes, at the end of the game, the king and the pawn go back in the same box. At the end of the game, the king and the pawn, you know, chess, go back in the same box. We were together when we saw the bumper sticker. We got a kick out of it. Um, some of the bumper stickers these days, but uh, that one was was witty and nice. Now, how would our remembering or keeping in mind that we are the same, just like everyone else, uh, be a most wonderful thing for us to be aware of or to remember? I think in regards to, to like humility. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think in regards to humility. Humility. Awesome. Absolutely. And wow. like our ability to and especially as Christians, to not see ourselves as superior or righteous over other people. There you go. Very good. <clears throat> very, very good. What else? <clears throat> the question again is, how will remembering or keeping in mind that we're just like everyone else would be a most wonderful thing for us? To keep in mind. Maybe even ability to relate to one another and share in one another's experiences. Awesome. Abigail's got two. To, to love and respect everyone. Yes. Thank you. To remember that we're all made in the image of God. Nice. And what will be what will be the effect of us remembering that we're all made in the image of God? We're all his creation. This is not like an exclusive membership. <laughs> Thank you. What else? <clears throat> okay, I'll share with you all some some points, and if you think of any, just jump in. So keeping in mind and being ever mindful that I'm just like everyone else, like the verses we just read, it will protect me from pride and arrogance, like Abigail said. It will protect me from all the isms, you know, like mom was saying, from racism, from sexism, from ageism, from, because racism, I could have been born in race. Like it's not like I I chose or had whatever over any uh, race I was in. Sexism, I could have born this or that. That's it. There's only two. <laughs> um, ageism is like you know, um, again, just like this will be me some years from now or some decades from now, or this was me some years ago or some decades ago. Also. It will help me be uh, empathetic or compassionate because I could have had the same circumstances as those around me who are less fortunate. I could have been born uh, poor. I could have been born in a third world country. I could have been born with a certain genetic disease. I could have been born missing a limb. I could have been born dead. I could have, you know what I'm saying? Uh, been born with... Uh, low IQ or autism or, or whatever, or with with an annoying personality. <laughs> um, I could have been born like like that. So it this will help me be um empathetic and compassionate. Also being mindful of this, that I'm just like everyone else, born like everyone else, will die like everyone else, etc. It will give me hope when I see someone living a godly, righteous life. If God can do this with them, then God can do this with me too. If I let him. If I let him. Remember earlier when we said, like, you believe that, you know, you can be a godly, righteous, wise saint. <clears throat> and the opposite is true. It will give me a very powerful forewarning. This is good, y'all. When I see someone falling into any kind of sin, right away I'll say, 
I too can fall in this just the same. Just like who, do you remember? This is one of the, the church fathers that we talked about. Who would cry when they see someone sinning or misbehaving or whatever. St. John the Dwarf or St. John the Short. <clears throat> and when he see somebody sinning or misbehaving, whatever, he would cry. And then eventually his uh, disciples or the monks told him, Father, like, why do you cry when, when you see someone sinning? And they thought he was saying it was because I, you know, I hate sin or because, you know, I don't like it when people sin in the monastery or in the house of God or whatever. But he proceeded to tell them, well, because if my brother or sister fell into this sin, that means I'm fully capable to fall into this sin too. And I don't want to fall into this sin. Or like he would start crying again. Um, so being mindful of this will 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 be a warning to me. Instead of me judging somebody when they mess up or fall into a bad sin, it will be a, a reminder for me or a warning. Oh, if they fell into the sin, that means I can too. Lord, have mercy. Lord, save me from me. Um, or from the circumstances that led my brother or sister to fall into this sin. Uh, also, it will help this me to be... Yes, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. This is like what Amber Gregory, you know, says uh, and he probably maybe he got it from saint john the short but him today me tomorrow yes him today me tomorrow no it was saint um theodore uh, of gaza or saint something of gaza um saint something of gaza that's very good <laughs> but anyway the important thing is is the quote him today me tomorrow uh also it will help me be very grateful because I could have had a very difficult life like so many others. I could have gone through the same disease or the same accident. But yeah, Ruth got it. Then today, me tomorrow. Um, this, this could be me. So, you know, uh, it will help me be grateful that, thank you, God, like this, this could have been me. Like I, I didn't have anything to do with not being this way, so thank you. And then also, it will cause me to sincerely and truly seek and pray for wisdom and discernment. Because I don't want to mess up. I don't want to lose what God gave me. I don't want to abuse what God gave me. <laughs> so see, like all the benefits from just remembering these. these somebody can read these few verses here and go like, okay. I too was born like everyone else. I too am gonna die like everyone else. I too like was formed in my mother's womb for ten months or forty weeks. You know, I too was nursed in swaddling cloths. The king, uh, uh, etc. In the pond, go back to the same box. So, but there's a lot of a lot of huge benefits from this. Okay, and now. We will see the beginning of Solomon um, seeking or praying for wisdom, which is lovely because he said those who are worthy of wisdom are the ones who sincerely seek it, right? So now and now he's he's applying that to himself. So let's read from verse seven through fourteen. Huh. Verse seven through fourteen. I can read. Thank you. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God in me. Um, I'll read from the bottom left one. And so I prayed, and understanding was given me. I entreated, and the spirit of wisdom came to me. I esteemed her more than scepters and thrones. Compared with her, I held riches as nothing. I reckoned no priceless stone to be her peer for compared with her all gold is a pinch of sand and beside her silver ranks as mud wow that's powerful <laughs> i loved her more than health or beauty preferred her to the light since her radiance never sleeps in her company all good things came to me at her hands riches not to be numbered all those i delight all these i delighted in since wisdom brings them but as yet i did not know she was their mother what I learned without self-interest, I pass on without reserve. I do not intend to hide her riches, for she is an inexhaustible treasure to men, and those who acquire it win God's friendship. 
commended as they are to him by the benefits of her teaching. Wow. All those verses are so powerful. Yep. I love that. That sums it up. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That's, yeah. Glory to the Holy Trinity, our God, now for on to the age of all ages. I mean, all right, let's let's slow down and and smell the roses and, and relish um this. Okay. So he's saying, I was born like everyone else, I will die like everyone else, I am like everyone else. Well then, Solomon, please tell us what on earth differentiated you from everyone else that you became so wise so he answers us in verse 7 and he says and so i prayed and understanding was given to me i entreated and the spirit of wisdom came to me it's this is not just something that uh i wish i was wise yeah i'd be pretty cool <laughs> no, no no it's like god like Please grant me wisdom. I, I want to live by wisdom. I want to be guided by wisdom. Lord, please don't let me mess up my life. Lord, help me, you know, to handle every situation with wisdom, etc., etc. Remember, that was the first point to be worthy of wisdom, to sincerely like plead and beg and entreat for her. <clears throat> there it is right here. What else, King Solomon, or... Mr. Solomon, the author. Verse 8. It says, I esteemed her more than scepters and thrones. Compared her, uh, compared with her, I held riches as nothing. Remember who said that? To me, it was all like nothing. Garbage. Compared to her. Saint Augustine. St. Paul. St. Paul in the Bible. Like all the stuff, like being born very rich, being a Roman citizen, being the student of Gamaliel, speaking multiple languages, uh, being a Pharisee, having tons of knowledge, being uh, respected and feared and having so much power and authority. All this considered as rubbish. He wasn't being like cynical or, or, or like uh, depressed or whatever. No, 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 no. He was just saying like, it's me, whatever. It's no biggie. Um, I esteemed her more than scepters and thrones, more than kingdoms. Compared with her, I held riches as nothing. And now he expresses to us how much he valued her and how much to him wisdom compared to all the other things that most people today or most people always seek after, and plead for, and entreat God for. It's in verse 9. It says, I reckon no priceless stone to be her peer. Don't even compare. For compared with her, all gold is a pinch of sand. And besides her, silver ranks as mud. St. Augustine said that. He said, I, I became, uh, or I sat on top of the world and became uh, the richest when I desired nothing. Something like that. Like Ten Sabuni ruined the quote. Does anybody know the quote? I sat on top of the world when I desired nothing. Something like that from this world. Oh, they tell you that the richest uh person ever is not the one who has everything, it's the one who wants nothing. So, question for me and for you. That's, uh, that's, no, that's Psalm 73. Uh, besides you, there's nothing on earth that I want. Okay. Uh, that's Psalm 73. Um, so a question for me and for you. Where on our radar is the seeking of wisdom and the seeking to be disciplined compared to the seeking of wealth and financial stability? Don't answer that one. 
answer it, but answer it to yourself. Where on our radar is the seeking of wisdom and to be disciplined compared to the seeking of wealth and financial stability? Oh, thanks, Ruth. I sat on top of the world when I came to fear nothing and desire nothing but you. Nice. Thank you. <clears throat> King of the world. <laughs> um, now, some of us may say, no, no, I truly value wisdom more than wealth. I really do. Okay, great. Forget wealth. Let's go to verse 10. He says, I loved her more than health or beauty. Hmm. Because actually, some people love health or beauty more than wealth. And they spend all their wealth on health and beauty. Or really, it's like two phases of life. They waste their health and beauty in order to acquire, to accumulate wealth. And then they waste their wealth in order to regain back their health and beauty. <laughs> Isn't that funny? In a sad way. Okay. I'm going to ask another question for me and for you. Where on your radar is the seeking of wisdom and to be disciplined compared to the seeking of health and beauty. No, y'all, if people spent half the energy and the effort and time that they seek after health and beauty in seeking after wisdom, this world would be a much better place. I won't say heaven because I don't know what heaven is going to be like because I can't even imagine it, but if if we really put some effort into seeking after wisdom and discernment and seeking to be disciplined to learn to improve that's why jesus said be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect and now he starts this is so good y'all he starts describing wisdom and some of her attributes um this is, I'm hoping, another list that we're going to try to, to keep track of. It starts from the, the second half of, of verse 10. I'm going <clears throat> yeah. Real quick. Um, I think for me, it's important to say that it's not that it's wrong to desire those things, but that isn't the aim. That shouldn't be the aim that wisdom that god is your first and foremost by a lot should be your aim agreed and everything else is well i'm interested in it i desire it um i have an interest in it but it isn't it isn't your god absolutely if if i gain and grow in wisdom and discernment it's not an on off switch you have it or you don't it's something it's a spectrum of growing because wisdom is god and like so god is infinite then when i desire or if i desire wealth or or i'm interested in this or in that then it will be for the right reasons for the wise reasons <laughs> um yes absolutely we're not picking on on wealth or health or beauty here but just putting things in the right order, which requires huh? discernment. <laughs> uh, so in describing wisdom and her attributes and stuff like that, it starts from the, like, the second half of verse 10. He says, um, wisdom, that he preferred her to the light since her radiance never sleeps. So even though the sun goes down and it gets dark where one cannot see or think of any source of light, light bulb, whatever. Sooner or later, it goes off. The light of wisdom never sleeps, never fades away. It actually, if one remains clinging on to her and seeking after her, it's not a one-time thing, it's a, it's a lifestyle, then her radiance only increases. It doesn't just fade away, it increases. Um, if someone hands me something, but it's kind of dark in the room, say I live with somebody who doesn't like overhead lights and just prefer lamps or something, <laughs> hypothetically speaking, 
um, if someone has me something, but it's kind of dark, what do I do with this thing in my hand? I'll bring it closer to the light, right? I'll hold it up to the light. And the closer I bring it to the light, the clearer I see it for what it really is without a shadow of a doubt. No pun intended. So likewise, or intended, um, whatever life puts in my hands, whatever life throws at me, the more I bring it closer to the light, to the light of the world, and hold it up to the light of God, the clearer I can see it, the more accurately I can identify it, and the better I know what to do with it and how. Her radiance never sleeps and only increases. So, not just what life hands you, but the more you expose your life, meaning your thoughts, your words, your deeds to the light, the more you will know your own identity and the more likely you will know your strengths and weaknesses and the more likely you will live the best life you can live. Now, we expose our life to the light of the world. How? In the Bible, in the sacrament of repentance and confession, we literally like expose ourselves. And in worthily uniting with the light in communion. Capital L. Now, if I am not in the Bible and I don't practice the sacrament of repentance and confession regularly, but I take communion regularly, you think that'll do it? It's those three together. It's another trinity that is one in three and three in one. You cannot separate them. You cannot do, do two out of the three. We need to expose ourselves to the light of the world in the Bible, in his word, the sacrament of repentance and confession, and in worthily uniting with the light and worthily taking communion. Um, continuing with the, the attributes or characteristics of light, verse 11 it says, in her company, all good things came to me. Why is that? Or how is that? Because no matter what life throws at me, I seek wisdom diligently and early. So no matter what, uh, I handle the situation like the wisest way I can at that moment. So sooner or later, good things come to me. We used to tell our kids this a ton when they were very, very little. would say like, when you make good choices, good things happen. When you make bad choices, bad things happen. Um, in her company, all good things came to me sooner or later, not immediately. And then there's another one in the other half of verse 11. It says, in her company, all good things came to me at her hands, riches not to be numbered. Without number. Wait, 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 wait. So wisdom will bring me riches that cannot be numbered? Wisdom will make me rich? What do you think? No, it's not. It's obviously not worldly wealth. It's um, it's the wealth that can't be um, can't be counted like just having joy. Um the comfort and peace that only yes. God can bring. Yes. Yes. So the answer is not no. The answer is actually yes. Yes. Wisdom will, me, will make me rich. 
but not monetary riches or material wealth, like Michael say, but rather the true riches of life and the wealth of not being in need of anything, like the quote um, Root shared with us by St. Augustine, I sat on top of the world when I came to fear nothing and desire nothing but you. So be careful, we're not a prosperity gospel uh, preachers here, okay? The, the true riches that matter, not, not monetary financial wealth. Um, and then he says something very interesting in verse 12. All these I delighted in, since wisdom brings them. But as yet, I did not know she was their mother. All these I delighted in, since wisdom brings them all. All these what? Health, wealth, beauty, whatever, you name it. The riches, the true riches that we're talking about. But yet, I did not know she was their mother. What does this verse mean to you? In talking about wisdom as she is the source of everything. Yes. Tell me more. What, what, what does this tell you? You know, what, what I'm thinking is, they say, like, pride is the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. Well, the antithesis of that would be that wisdom is the root of all the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And very, very close. Wisdom is God, right? <laughs> or God is wisdom. No. <laughs> yes. This tells us, y'all, that he did not set his heart to seek after the light or the radiance that never fades. He did not set his heart to seek after having good things come to him. He did not seek after having riches that cannot be numbered. Okay, That's, that's not what he set out to do. He just sought after wisdom. And like Michael was saying, it's the source of all this stuff and all those wonderful, lovely things that he just described, started happening. They started coming. And I think this is, this is very, very important, y'all. Because he is wise, and he knows that wisdom doesn't run out. She's not limited, just like God doesn't run out. He's not limited. Therefore, verse 13, look at this. This is like what Abigail just like, wow. What I learned without self-interest, I pass on without reserve. I do not intend to hide her riches. He's saying, I learned this without self-interest. If you look at the other version, it says, I learned this without guile, without falsehood so this tells us that one can seek wisdom in falsehood or with guile this is huge this is huge y'all please pay attention to this we need to be careful not to seek after the fruit of wisdom but rather to seek after wisdom herself in other words um, that you've heard before, do not seek after the gifts of God or the benefits of God, but rather seek after God himself and a personal, intimate, genuine relationship with God himself. And if we seek after those things outside the boundaries of God, there will actually be a destruction to us. Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first and foremost the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. So, the question each one of us that I hope is already asking himself or herself right now in their mind, 
as honestly as possible is this. Do I see God for God? I don't know. Maybe the first question is, do I see God? Period. <laughs> question mark. But if I do, do I see God because I want him and a friendship with him? Or do I see God because I want his benefits, his peace, his protection, his blessings, his comfort? Sadly, um, with many of us, and I've been guilty of this, it is the latter. And the evidence of this is that when God gives us those things, what do we do? We, we, we take it and we walk away. And, and we forget him or we stop pursuing him. Or we stop fasting and praying and reading and taking communion, being regular confessions and stuff like that. And when we don't get what we want from him, that's the, the reverse side of the evidence, is we get angry with him. And with some of us, we leave him. Right away, this tells you that you weren't seeking him. You were seeking his gifts and benefits. Can I add another thing to that, Abuna? Please. Is that I think that sometimes when we're seeking him in with guile or whatever you're saying, is that when we get the gift, we hoard it. Because like what King David or the wise person here did is that they received it without guile and then they freely gave it. So like they were a conduit as opposed to like a, a reservoir. Really, you have received, freely give. Mm. But if that's the case, um, does that mean that I have really received wisdom and discernment? Or maybe that I've received, I don't know, knowledge? Um, like, it makes me wonder. I'm not challenging what you're saying. I'm just making me wonder if, if, if I received true wisdom, would I really hoard it? Yeah, I'm still. No, gonna... I'm talking. I'm okay. not talking about receiving. Sorry, Michael. I'm not talking about receiving the wisdom. I'm talking about receiving the gifts, right? Because we can seek God, and then we get these gifts. But if ah, we're gotcha, gotcha, if gotcha. we're hoarding the gifts, then maybe our seeking was not completely free of guile. Let's say. Yes, and but God will fix that because he loves us. How? He said it. He said, to him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. To him who has, more will be given. And to him who does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. What was he talking about here? The, 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 the good deeds, the, the, the sharing. To him who has means to him who shares, who gives. You know, who does not hoard it, more will be added to him because God wants to use this as a conduit, like you're saying. And to him who does not have, meaning they hoard it, they keep it to themselves, you know, all the benefits or whatever, then even what they have will lose. Either they will literally lose it physically or they will lose the um, the feelings they may have when they have it. Like they may be rich, but they will feel poor. They may be healthy, but they will feel sick. They may be... Um, whatever, comfortable, but they will feel tired. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, goodness. It's 8.25. Um, man. Let's, uh, well, let's, let's do verse, uh, 14 real quick because we read we read through uh, 14 and and then we'll uh, we can finish uh next week so verse 14 let me make sure I'm on the so we said hey, I pass it I pass on without reserve I do not intend to hide it for her riches verse 14 for she is an exhaustible an inexhaustible treasure to men and those who acquire it 
win God's friendship, commended as they are to him by the benefits of her teaching. How lovely. Um, everything we use, uh, as we use it, it decreases. Everything we share or we give, as we share or give more of it, decreases or is depleted. What is the only thing that when you share it with others or give it to others, both you and they have more of it? Love, Yabuna. Love. Yes. And as the Bible tells us that God is love. And as we've seen here a million times, wisdom is God. She is inexhaustible, infinite. So the more you share or give wisdom, the more both you and the recipients, others, will have wisdom. The more wisdom there is on earth. Just like love. You can use them interchangeably. Love, God, wisdom. Um, so, so far in the last chapter, we read three ways to become worthy of wisdom, to seek it sincerely, to apply it, to live in, in, with it in our life, and then to not swerve from truth and to not take envy as a travel companion. And then today we saw three attributes or characteristics of wisdom. What are they? That the light of wisdom never sleeps or fades away. It actually, um, if one remains clinging on to her, her radiance only increases. Meaning I see more and more and I see with more and more clarity and more and more truth. The second characteristic or attribute um, of wisdom is that because I diligently and early seek wisdom in any situation, I am always doing the wisest thing I'm capable of at that moment. So good things come to me. Good things happen because of wisdom. Like we said before, what makes a fantastic life a great life is not to do some one big great thing. No. What makes a great life is the culmination of making very good everyday little decisions that I make a bunch of every day, one by one by one. Just always do the best that I'm capable of, the wisest thing. And that adds up. That means I'm at peace. I'm always going on doing, knowing that I'm doing the best that I can. And then the third attribute or characteristic of wisdom is that wisdom will give me the true riches of life. Not necessarily monetary riches, but will make my life rich, will make my life worth living. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and stop here. Um, God willing, next time we will resume from verse 15. From chapter 7, verse 15. And I lost my... Oh, there it is. Um, and... Next time, now we're going to see the effects of wisdom on someone or the results of having wisdom. Okay, before we part ways, uh, any comments or questions or anything you'd like to add or ask or, or if anything you want to share that like really stood out to you today? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll start off with like something I'll, I'll reflect on. And then I also have a question. Um, as far as a reflection, you could seek beauty, physical beauty, but eventually you'll lose it. If you seek wisdom, you'll begin to see the beauty in everything. And nice. if you seek material wealth, you'll eventually lose it. But if you seek wisdom, you'll you'll feel rich no matter what you have. Um, Very nicely put. 
as far as the question I have about good things will f follow you, does that also come, is that also referring to the fact that God said, and he called it all good? So no matter what the situation, all things that come from God are good. Yes. Uh, like I said, it's Romans 8, 28. God causes all things to work for the good of those who love him. Yeah. Meaning those who, who want wisdom for wisdom. So then, then everything will be good. Good does not necessarily mean pleasant. You know, I can, uh, I was talking with someone um, earlier today and uh, they made a bad choice. And because of that, they were, uh, they spent the night in jail and, uh, in jail for, for just a night and then they were released and everything was fine or whatever. But so that was very good for them. It was very unpleasant for them. <laughs> and it was very good for them because it was very unpleasant for them. And it was like a wake up call and it helped them change their path and all kinds of great things. Um, so good things will come does not necessarily um, pleasurable, you know, easy, whatever, things will come. Um, question in the chat. Um, can wisdom give you self-love in a good way? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. Um, remember that the second greatest commandment, God said, love, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself, meaning love your neighbor as you love yourself. I need to love myself. Now, loving myself does not mean I make a big, big statue for <laughs> myself. Or sometimes when I visit people like, you know, who, who move to their new homes, I say, oh, right here above the fireplace, you need to put a big life-size picture of me as a joke. Um, that's not loving self. Loving when you, Love means action. Love means give. Loving self means I do what's right for self. I work on the salvation of self. I... Stay away from what harms self. I respect myself. Um, I treat myself with dignity and behave in dignity. I do what's best for myself, which is God. Wisdom. Self-love is definitely not like those... Um, I don't know if people do that anymore. I remember a long time ago, maybe 80s, 90s, people would sleep with a a Walkman, remember the Walkman? And uh, with headphones kind of like this and saying like, while they're asleep, like, I'm awesome. I am wonderful. I'm beautiful. I'm great. I'm resourceful. And that's not self-love. Um, it's a, maybe a, a demented way of self-love. Um, hey, yeah. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else? And Sandy. Something that stood out to you or if you have a question or anything? Just kind of more of like what I had said when I was reading, like these verses, I feel like were very powerful. And um, it really just stood out to me because I think this is one book out of the Bible that really highlights the importance of wisdom. Like I don't, I haven't ever heard it discussed like this before or, and, and I just like, I think it's really beautiful and powerful. Mm. The whole book is, is, is about wisdom, true wisdom. And yeah, like it makes you want to go back and, and read, read them over again and over again and, and to kind of just soak it in. Um, Yeah, I'll, I'll say, like what Abigail is saying, like, you know, wisdom is spread out through the entire Bible. But this book really, really elevates, really elevates her. Yeah. Laser focuses on, on wisdom. Cool. So, um, Try to think about some of the stuff that we read today. Oh, like I'm like everyone else. 
and all the benefits that come from that. Um, and to check myself and make sure that am I like am I really seeking God for Him because I want Him or because I want the benefits I get from Him. And perhaps that's hard to answer, but I it, it would be answerable by what do I do when life is great and I have everything I want? Do I forget God um, or dismiss him or whatever? And also, what do I do when life is terrible? Do I shun God or be mad at him or, or, or I don't know, stop going to church or stop reading the Bible or whatever, or like doubt him or whatever? Um, it's a big one. All right, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, Lord, I, I uh, feel like we dove into an ocean of you, and uh, it's, it's, it's so fun to uh, just peel the layers and, and to discover more and more of you. Lord, please don't let this be a momentary thing. Let these words nail them into our flesh, O oh Lord. Um, let them be chiseled into our brains so that we're ever mindful of them and so that we can apply them in our everyday life. Help us, O oh Lord, to seek you or you. Whatever comes with that. We ask you to please hear us. So the intercessions have me and all you saints and martyrs, so please hear from the me and through the mighty power of your life giving cross. Please, O Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us as they are daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the love of God, the Father, grace is only God, Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. The communion and the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. And your spirit. Thank you all so much. And we'll see you, Thank you, uh, next, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Wednesday, God willing. Bye, all. Good night, everybody. Bye.